All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Kick Pod Podcast, the podcast dojo of inspirational martial arts talk. I am your host, TJ Williams, fourth degree black belt of the Chuck Norris system and on a quest to become fifth degree next year. All right, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> All right, so just to make things real quick, uh, of course, for those who are just joining, joining me, uh, this podcast is all martial arts based. I mean, I talk about my experience. Uh, I discuss and analyze martial arts based subjects. And I also highlight martial artists for all, all styles, past, present, and future. And that brings me to my guest today. Of course, uh, he's um, a black belt, or should I say, as well as me, he's a podcaster. And of course, he has his own um, um, dojo, and as well as he's an author of his book, Becoming Bullyproof. I like to introduce everybody to Rich Grogan. All right, so he's agreed to come talk to me today. All right, how are you doing, Rich? I'm doing very well, sir. Thank you so much for having me on, and uh, thank you for what you're doing uh, with your podcast and continuing to not only, uh, when we swapped uh, Facebook messages there, your schedule sounded like uh, mine. You're uh, a busy, busy man doing all kinds of things to make the world a better place uh, with what you're doing, and uh, I'm a Chuck Norser as well, a part of Tongue Sudo, so uh, then... <laughs> Started back in uh, 1979, 80. So I had an opportunity to train over in Korea four different times and meet uh, Kwon Jin Wong Ki, which uh, you know is Chuck Norris' original instructor. So yep. we are brothers in, in in a lot of ways, and that's uh, that gives me goosebumps and makes me feel good. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of track back to, of course, before you got started in martial arts. Sorry. So how would you describe yourself before you started martial arts? Well, I had uh, um, I grew up on a farm and uh, uh, farm boy bailing hay, shoveling poo. And one of the ways kids would uh, kind of bully me and make fun of me is uh, we were we were literally so poor. We had a milk cow. And uh, so even at uh, eight, nine years old, I'm out there milking the milk cow. And, you know, kids are kids. They're going to be mean. They're going to bully. But it was one of the things that was like, uh, what's that smell? Oh, it's, it's Richie. He smells like cow poop. He's so poor he can't even afford milk. And it was true. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was uh, blessed because growing up on a farm, it, it was cold and stuff. So I got a lot of work breaking the ice and uh, with, with horse troughs and bailing hay and shoveling poo. But uh, I had an opportunity to play ice hockey. That was my first dream to be a pro hockey player. Uh, it didn't work out, of course, but no big deal there. But uh, um, I was always a small person, but very strong because of all the farm duties. But uh, um, I, Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris is what kind of got me going in martial arts. Uh, I always liked uh, their movies and admired them, especially uh, Bruce. He was a small guy. And then Chuck Norris, of course, he was big to me, but uh, um, he, he was a fairly small guy as well. But uh, watching him, Chuck Norris, throw those spinning back kicks and spinning wheel kicks. And then, you know, Bruce Lee doing what he did is like, oh, my gosh, I want to do that. I can do that. And I uh, talked to Grandma, found somebody at uh, it was a a member of a church that was teaching a summer camp, uh, Tung Sudo. And uh, one thing led to another. And before I know it, I was taking a summer camp and then enrolled in martial arts. And it was, it was good because once again, being, uh, yeah, we, like I said, we, we, we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, the guy from the church was able to, uh, as long as you worked hard, he was able to, uh, to accommodate and uh, tuition. Uh, and I, it, was, it was more of a donation. So we were able to make it happen. Yeah, so you definitely were prepared for doing all that farm work. And then, of course, when you want to achieve your, achieve your dream of doing martial arts, I mean, there's probably a lot of karate studios out there, but you found one that really kind of fits, fits your, um, so to say, I don't know, how would you say it like you? Well, it, it was um, it was something I wanted to do. It was, uh, like I mentioned, it was... Goodness gracious, 1979, 1980, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, nine years old at the time. And... Uh, Grandma happened to find it was a, it was a guy that uh, went to the church that she went to and and I went to sporadically I, I, I probably should have done a better job of going as a kid but uh, and she found the guy and uh, um, he, he it all checked out and now and, and this is probably jumping ahead a little bit here but as crazy as things are. I had stopped training for, um, well, a, a short amount of time because I was going to pursue my NHL career that, that never happened. And, uh, um, and it, it, was, it was a painful blow, but just it just wasn't. I wasn't good enough. That's all there is to it. I was okay yeah. down here, but went up north a little bit, and they're, they're, they're pretty good up there. But uh, um, So I decided to get back into martial arts, and I, and I still trained, but I didn't have a quote, quote, instructor. Well, I found one at an Army Depot I started going to, and, and lo and behold, he, the gentleman, Sabadim George Mans is his name, was the, the guy that I trained with before his instructor. 
So how crazy is that? And then, of course, he trained under Quan Jin Wong Ki, which was Chuck Norris's instructor. So, I mean, how yeah. nuts was that stuff? But uh, just kind of blessed how things uh, uh, came together there. But you know as well as I do, you're willing to put yourself out there and do the extra work. Uh, things things align for you. It doesn't mean it's easy, but they align for you as opposed to sitting back and you know expecting things to happen. And you're is all everything you're doing. I kind of look, all the, the things you're doing with your martial arts academy and the aerobics and boxing and kickboxing and everything else you're doing fitness programs to to to, to help people. You got that work ethic, and uh, that needs to be recognized because oftentimes I'm sure you do the same. You talk to folks, and they want to know how, how uh, you know you're an overnight success. How did that happen? Well, <laughs> all the work you put in is how it happened. Yeah, I can I can highly relate to that. I mean, for me, of course, I become strongly attached to martial arts because um, of the, all the years I've trained. It's like now, other than trying to focus on my style, I'm like trying to discover. This is why I got the podcast. I'm trying to discover other martial arts styles and, you know, I'm trying to get myself to learn a new kind of outside of my, um, out of my, outside of my style. I'm trying to perform it for my um, convention that's coming up this in July. So I'm, look, I'm really excited about that convention. I love um, going to the ITC is like, that's just our, like, almost like our family reunion. That's how I look at our, my martial arts style. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I respect that. Uh, Tung Sudo has always been the primary base, and I was with the organization for twenty something years, and uh, we parted ways in two thousand fourteen. Um, it was it, it was just the right time to go. They had kind of lost, uh, in my humble opinion, their their vision and their focus. Uh, you know, before it was you know anywhere from five to seven years to get a black belt, and they started making it two years and uh, to each their own. But to me, it's got to be earned. And now, what we do with our academy, it's right at the uh, the threshold of six to seven years uh, minimum to earn a black belt. And uh, what I've tried to do is a combination of styles, almost a Bruce Lee philosophy, which is what you're doing. Uh, I'm a believer you bring it, you take it all in, you disregard which doesn't align with your core values or what is in alignment with who you are. And uh, and then what you do is you add your unique flavor. I always like to say you, everybody's got a God-given talent. Add your unique flavor, uh, the, the Kung Fu Panda, the secret formula, secret recipe, right? It's and you. that's what makes it uniquely you. Yep. And that's what we've done. And uh, for your listeners out there, that especially those that are, you know, maybe trying to find themselves or trying to find the right uh, uh, fit. I, I, I was a guy that would chase the shiny red object and like, oh, I'll be this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And, and it's it's fine to try and learn that. But when you're trying to be everything for everyone, you end up being nothing for no one. So stick to your core values of what you are. And that's, uh, uh, that's what really helped our academy excel and succeed was we focus on primary self-defense, A, number one, or, which lines with our bullyproof program. And then along with that character development, leadership and life skills. And we call that our bullyproof program. So we, we personally don't do a lot of tournaments anymore. I used to, but now we focus primarily on any type of uh, self-defense situation that I can see a child or an adult uh, on a playground or, you know, outside a club or anywhere else, how they can defend themselves with practical self-defense. But the most important thing is the character development, leadership and life skills on how they're going to make society a better place to live and not with your fist, but with hopefully you can keep your hands open and use your mind. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's what I relate to my students. You know, I just don't tell, teach them martial arts. I at least teach them like life skills. You know, I always tell them to trust me as Mr. Williams or say, yes, sir, as you come, as you move back. No, sir. That's that's the one thing that I teach my students. You know, I want them to be decent people as they grow up. You know, I definitely grew up with a lot of people that um, went down that bad path. And, you know, I tell them you don't want to go down that path. I mean, you want to stay on this like a straight path and not make any detours to the like a dead end. So that's what I definitely teach my students. Sure. And, 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 you know, I'm sure you probably questioned why you were going through some of the experiences you went through young, when you were younger. Uh, you know, I, I know I did why in the world, but now you, you have that as your foundation that you can share with others. I've seen too many people go down this path, or I've personally gone down this path or whatever it is that you can share wholeheartedly with your students to help, you know, save them uh, some struggles or some hardships along the way there. Yeah. All right. Well, can you remember your first lesson when you started out? Like, can you like remember the, like the first thing you did, not, not, not like whole class, but like one thing you've learned? 
Yeah, um, the, 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 the first lesson was, um, it was outdoors because it was an outdoor summer camp. And um, we, uh, we, we, we got right in without ever doing anything, right into sparring. And uh, um, <laughs> now I had, you know, uh, an older cousin growing up, we used to beat the snot out of me all the time. So, I mean, I, I felt pretty good about some of the sparring. I just didn't have the confidence. So it was, was kind of crazy going right into it, but I loved it because uh, being a smaller person and being a hockey player, we would scrap on the ice, you know, most of the time playing around, but sometimes we'd get serious, even because that was back in the seventies and the eighties, things were a little bit different back then. Uh, so that that's what we did. And, uh, um, and, and I remember another meaningful thing within the first week or so was uh, um, attempting to break a board with a sidekick. And I, I had a hard a heck of a hard time doing it. As a matter of fact, I could I, I couldn't do it. And uh, I, of course, at that time as a kid, you get defeated and this and that. And the instructor is real good about picking me up. But I relate to that often when uh, other kids uh, at the academy now are having trouble doing a break. And I say, yeah, I get it. <laughs> and of course, at the time, it's like, why can't I break this gosh darn board? You know, <laughs> and, and then back then, it didn't matter what age you were, you had the, the 12 inch pie, the board. So, you know, we, we, we do a job now, the little kids, we try and cut them down to four inches and six inches, and then they work their way up to the 12s. But back in those days, that, that's all we had. You break it or you don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, what would say? What would you say your favorite moments in martial arts would be? You know, my favorite moment always is going to be when I first got my first degree black belt. I mean, that's like my favorite moment. I got more favorite moments, but that's the day I got my first degree. That was like my most favorite moment. I was a senior in high school, and of course, there was like around the weekend that we have our um our high school dance, and of course, I played football the the day before my test, which surprisingly nothing bad happened. So. Good thing I was able to take it. Yeah. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, so, well, I, I'll touch on the first degree test. I, um, oh, goodness. It, uh, it was a long time coming, but because uh, 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 when I started back with the like, uh, current instructor, Sabin so Mans, he, um, he was switching organizations still with Tung Sudo, but kind of moving back to the original roots. He had, uh, uh, was with a guy named, um, oh my goodness gracious. Um, oh goodness. Can't remember his name right now. Anyway, he was part of the American Tung Sudo and, uh, um, his Don number was Don number 39. And think about that. And, uh, he, um, is J. Jun Kim, J. Jun Kim. That's who it was. And, uh, um, but, he wanted to go back to the roots with Quan Jin and Wong Ki, which was the United States Tung Sudo Mutaquan organization at that time. And so when we switched organizations, he was a six degree black belt. He had, he got, I don't want to say demoted, but he said he had to go back to third degree black belt, which was extremely honorable, but he did it. And then I was ready to test. I don't know, I was ready to test for Don, but getting close. Well, I had to go back to green belt. So it was, it was humbling. It was frustrating, but it is what it is. Uh, I mean, obviously now I'm glad I stuck with it and did what I did, but I got to test for my first on and uh, I, I went in there and I was, I was ready to go. I had uh, everything. The breaking to me now was the easiest thing to do. And we had to do a jump spinning back kick, two boards at face level. Well, that was, that was my bread and butter. Well, all the way through the test was about a three, three and a half hour test of knocking things down, knocking it out, knocking it out. And I'm waiting for my opportunity to do my break. Well, I zoned out. I start thinking about, hey, who am I going to invite to my party to celebrate that I, I got my black belt? Am I going to get a cake? Yeah, I'm going to get a cake. Am I going to invite this person? So I'm thinking of anything and everything, but what I should be thinking about, which is the break, because the test wasn't over. Well, I get up my opportunity to break, and I'd done this break, I mean, literally blindfolded, both legs, no problem. I jump up and bang, hit those boards. First time they don't break. I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck just happened here? Jump up, hit them again. Bang. They don't break again. Now you will get three tries. So I'm like, oh my gosh, if I don't break it this time, I'm going to fail. Well, it was a complete mindset shut off. I jump up, hit them again. They don't break. Well, I'd failed my black belt test because I clocked out. So I tell that story because uh, Chuck Norris also failed his first Don test mm -hmm. by uh, 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 messing up a form. So yeah. I like to say, well, you know, I'm no better than Chuck Norris. So we both failed. But what Chuck 
uh, Carlos had said he had learned from that was never go into something ill-prepared again and to stay focused, which helped him throughout his life. And I kind of use that opportunity. I'd love to say that I've never lost focus again because I have, but it really helped prepare me saying, and I use that with our students now, don't clock out before the job is done. Don't let your mind uh, uh, drift off before what you need to do is done, especially in a, well, that was a test, but if a conflict comes, you can't wander off because man, that's when you're gonna get popped. So that wasn't a great memory at all at the time, but it was a great learning lesson. And uh, I've learned a lot from that, uh, from that testing. Yeah, I can't relate to that. No, I mean, like I was thinking like I didn't, I never failed my first and second three to test. But of course, when I got to my third, you know, I felt so confident because um, this was around the time that I lost some lost weight. I was like a big, um, big person. And then, you know, this is around the time I slipped down, kind of got um, into shape. And I thought I was going to get through that test. But of course, um, when I did the pre-test, I was like, really, I could not have no en energy. It's like I was ready to die. I mean, that's how I felt pretty much for my third and fourth degree test. It's like I was so low on energy and then that's how I ended up failing. But, you know, I kind of went back to it and kind of figure out what I needed to do. It's like I had to get like a lot of energy and I'll probably stick, keep hydrated and try to stay focused. And then, of course, um, here I am, fourth degree black belt. Right. And I'm retired that's next year. You said for fifth. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't have to test physically. I mean, of course, I have to take like MDM, MDM classes, um, master development series. So cool. I mean, get, get those out of the way. And then, of course, I get the okay from Mr. Norris. Yeah, that's why I call him to actually get my fifth degree, which I'm looking awesome. forward to. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, do you have do any other activities outside of martial arts? I mean, I know you mentioned hockey, which that didn't do good for you, but of course, like yeah, uh, um, I, I was actually a um, I've got a degree in uh, kinesiology education, the study of human movement, and uh, so I taught PE for eleven years. So um, three sports that I uh, well I, I love to play and, and and did pretty well in was baseball, football, and hockey. And uh, hockey was always the number one, and then I really loved football. Mom wouldn't let me play football until I got to middle school, but uh, still did well at that. And then baseball, um, I've picked up uh, well. Uh, a golf. I'll, I'll, I've moved to Florida here now, so I try and play a little bit. Uh, that's the hardest, easiest game I've ever played is golf. Oh my yeah. gosh. And nobody's coming at me. Nobody's trying to hit me. Oh, it's just me in the darn club. And that's what makes it tough. But um, another thing I did uh, for, for a number of years when I was trying to grow the martial arts academy uh, was I taught aerobics. <laughs> so you can mm -hmm. connect with that. I yep. taught that for uh, about 12 years. And uh, we, we called it uh, uh, Kick to Get Fit was kind of the name. I actually filmed a couple exercise videos back in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s called uh, Kick to Get Fit. And it was like a kick to get in shape, a kick to quit smoking, a kick to get over the hump, a kick to get fit. So that was something that we all tied in uh, with everything. And so, yeah, it was, uh, um, and, and I often share that uh, the, the physical side, it was always kind of, it had those hardworking roots from growing up on the farm uh, of working hard. So it was always the, the physical part. Um, I don't want to say I was ever the most gifted athlete, but I was always willing to outwork anybody knowing uh, um, I always kind of seemed like I had to prove myself. My hang up was always the, the mental side uh, um, and uh, staying, staying connected and staying focused. So that was always my little uh, hiccup, if you will. It still is today. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's go back to that aerobics. Um, back then, do you have to go like uh, get certified? Like for me, I had to get certified in AFA, which is um, aerobics. Yeah. Fit oh, so they did have AFA? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Alpha, yeah, absolutely. Aerobic Fitness so uh, Association of America was it? Yeah. 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 Alpha. That was my, uh, oh, goodness gracious. What year was that? 90. 394 maybe is uh when uh 94 i think it was with afa and uh and i went back to school and got my de degree in kinesiology with study of human movement so it all kind of tied in together there and uh and i want to about the schooling thing i'm the uh i'm the guy that took me well, 10 almost 11 years to get a two-year degree 
<laughs> and then two years to get to complete the four-year degree at, uh, at the university. So, <laughs> and uh, I was doing that while I was teaching aerobics, teaching martial arts, uh, being a personal fitness trainer, and just doing anything I could. Uh, my gosh, I was teaching aerobics at a couple different uh, universities, some junior colleges, any health club that would have me just to, just to kind of pay through college there. <laughs> uh, oh. And I was, I was married and had a kid at the time too. So it was, uh, it was a little crazy side. Oh yeah. It was a journey. I mean, when I became yeah. a fitness instructor, I mean, AFA wasn't my first um, certification. I was certified in um, Liz Mills body combat. I know oh. they had, I know they had that back then. Cause um, of course uh, I think we're on um, at least 80 or at least 90 or something, but that was like my first um, becoming a aerobics um, instructor, a fitness instructor. And no, I def I made a like, should I say, an impact doing that. Like before I got in, in uh, AFA, you know, I went from teaching one place to teaching like five places, mostly subbing. I mean, people just don't ask me. They begged. That's how good I taught. Yeah. I mean, and also. That's, hungry. That's good, too. Yeah, it's like you have that um a fitness um background with you, and then of course you kind of incorporate with martial arts, and of uh, of course, uh, yeah, that makes sure you know like when you're teaching kids like techniques, it's the same as teaching like your participants in fitness like the proper techniques. You know, you don't want them to get injured; you want them to do it right. So it's like you're in the technical phase right now. You're in a technical version, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that because it's yeah. uh, um, that was a big thing because uh, um, there were, uh, especially after uh, Billy Blanks had Taibo come out, and obviously he's a trained martial artist, he trained in Tung Sudo, um, but uh, you, you had everybody, the day before Taibo came out, no one knew what a punch or a kick was in the aerobic world. And the day after, everybody suddenly a Taibo expert. And you got them teaching sloppy technique and everything else. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I was focusing on, the, you know, the proper technique, snapping from the shoulders and the hips and everything else. And you got these others doing these what I call jackhammer arms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, it hurts my elbow doing that. So, uh, but no, that's a uh, proper technique is so key. Yeah, those jackhammer um what you call jackhammer punches, whatever you call them. Like yeah, really. I, you, you've seen it. I mean, they just go real fast. I'm like, what are you doing? You're just going to hyperextend your elbow and you're not working your body. And the same thing when they do the, the kick with the leg and just flop the knee out there. I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you use the body here. Yeah. I always tell them, keep their elbow down when they're doing yeah. a jab. Oh, yeah. And snap with the body. And I would always say, look, uh, and working on the techniques, especially the uppercuts, I say, I want you to keep it inside more than you would if even if you were fighting, because I want to work the obliques and the abs as you twist and turn there. I said, so get more of a workout and let that thing go, as opposed to, yeah, the, 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 the jab. That was always the thing. They had the elbows up. And we I, in martial arts, I always called it chicken wing. I said, if you're chicken winging, <laughs> <laughs> you're certainly, it's not a good thing keep those elbows down <laughs> yeah same with that front kick deal it's all doing snapping front kick you know i tell them if you're gonna throw a straight front kick think if you're kicking the door open yeah 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 absolutely and it, it, because yeah i'm kidding it's you know there's the, the knee and the elbow that this uh, it gave me the heebie-jeebies seeing that i'm like oh my gosh i said how do you think you're gonna work out because i'm going fast you're going fast destroying the joint you ain't working the body <laughs> yeah all right so let's get to your like bully bully pro proof program um of course what's what's the one experience that um had you create this or of course your own experience but is there anything you've seen anybody else like getting bullied that's told you like this is it i want to create this program so this we can minimize bullying yeah in, in, in the to be honest it was um uh I, i'm kind of on my own on this one, but um, definitely the reason I talk about this a lot is, is because I, I want to kind of, I guess, open some minds up. You see a lot of bully prevention programs or a lot of stop bullying programs, and that's all good to spread awareness. But bullying's been around since Cain and Abel. The first two brothers walked the face of the earth. Yep. I wasn't around then, neither were you or anybody else. Mm -hmm. Bullying now with social media is far worse. So it's never going to stop. What we can do is, is we can empower the kids, parents, teens, and adults with the bullyproof armor, which is like bulletproof armor, right? Or the <laughs> armor of God, bullyproof, to empower them to overcome any bully or stand up to any bully they face, both real and in their mind. Because just because we help a kid right now in third grade deal with a bullying situation, well, then he goes to fourth grade. If he hasn't become empowered to become bullyproof, then 
we got to be there to help him again, but maybe we're not. But if he can do it on his own, that's the key of the bully proof. And it's not that we can stop it. It's never going to stop. Yeah, that's, that's, that's honorable to say we're going to stop bullying. But I say, look, let's empower the kids to deal with it when it comes. Because maybe a child never deals with it, but then they become a teenager and an adult. They become an adult and they've got a boss who's a bully or a jerk. Well, did that, does that mean they punch them out? Does that mean they hide in fear? No, you become bullyproof. You stand up to it and you stop it as soon as possible. So what we kind of created with the bullyproof program is what I call the ABCs. Uh, A is awareness and avoidance. Be aware of, of dangerous situations. Be aware of the way you carry yourself. If you carry yourself like a victim, you're probably going to be a victim. Carry yourself like a victor. Carry yourself like a hero. doesn't mean you're arrogant and cocky, but it means you carry yourself with confidence. And then the B is believe in yourself with your bullyproof armor through positive affirmations, through positive self-talk you know, by being aware of not saying negative things about ourselves. And oftentimes we're our own worst bully by saying, I'm an idiot. I suck. I can't do this. Well, we're bullying ourselves. We're planting negative seeds in there. And, and people hear us talk to ourselves like that. It's an open invitation for them to talk to us like that. So that's the B. The C is communicate clearly and confidently with your posture, your shoulders back. And I call it tiger's eyes and lion's voice it means when you talk, you talk with a purpose. And it doesn't mean you have to scream at anybody, but you let them know with your eyes that you're confident. Now, you may be scared to death on the inside. You might be in your pants, but on the outside, you project confidence. And then D, if it gets to that, hopefully if you follow the A, B, and C, chances are you can avoid most of the situations. But if anybody physically puts their hands on you and tries to hurt you or assault you, that's not bullying anymore. That's a crime. Now you have the right to physically defend yourself. And that's where I'm different than a lot of folks because a lot of folks say, don't fight at any cost. Well, my thing is, look, if you don't do something to physically stop the attack, <laughs> the pressure is going to build up. And the suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34, because most kids don't know what to do. They let it out on themselves and end up taking their own life. So I'm all about, look, somebody physically puts their hands on you, you physically defend yourself. <laughs> And I mean, I'm out in public, you know, I'm, I have my eyes all over the place, you know, I'm trying to watch for myself. I'm trying not to hurt anybody, but at the same time, you know, I don't want anybody to be hurting me or trying to take, take anything away from me. I mean, I know where I'm at, you know, I see a lot of crazy, I call them crazies, you know, that's like, really, it's like, they're out at night and, you know, they're always like, I just say not asking for money, but you know, they're just like, I don't, I don't know you, but just kind of keep your distance. So I don't want to hurt you. So just keep where you're at. So. Well, and, and everything you did, and obviously you've trained martial artists. That's all I'm trying to do with the Bullyproof brand is pass on what you just said there, that awareness knowledge to speak confidently, use your eyes and look at people and to say, hey, keep your distance, you know, stay back. But you're aware of that. But as you and I both know, and I'm going to bring my phone up here, this is what everybody's head is in. It's in the phone. They don't have any idea what the heck's going on around them. All they do is they're glued to this phone. Well, put the darn phone down the time you walk from wherever you're going to your car. I, I promise you're popular. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people out there. You're popular. Yes, but you can wait. Whatever's on social media can wait. <laughs> get to your car safely first. And then when you get in the car, lock those darn doors. And then I always encourage people to start the car immediately, because if you do get on your phone, you're going to realize, holy cow, my car's been running. And the price of gas, you don't want that car running too long, then drive your butt home. Yeah. The longer you sit in the parking lot, the more uh, vulnerable you are to be a victim. Get out of there. Get home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I always tell my students, like, if you're in a self-defense situation, what's your number one goal? Your goal is to go home. I mean, that person that's stopping you from going home, I mean, that's the person that's going to, yeah, you're not going to go home at all. So, yeah. Nah. Yeah, we're, we're on the same line there. And, and you know, it's a blessing. I'm, do, I'm blessed to get an opportunity to talk to a lot of folks and get on a lot of podcasts. And I don't always agree with a, a lot of the stuff out there because I'm like, hey, you teach your way you want to teach. But uh, I, I'm, I we're, we're connecting here on uh, safety for our kids, but being aware and doing the right thing, because if we don't teach them, who the heck's going to? Yeah, I can definitely relate. I mean, really, if there's nobody else to help, then who else would help? I mean, I mean, you got so many people out there that's neat are asking for our help. I mean, I see these kids coming there. They're having a bad day, but they're really asking for our help. Yep. yep. So that's kind of how the, uh, the, the bully proof came. It was, uh, uh, oh goodness, six or seven years ago. Now um, it was always part of what we taught. 
Uh, but I wanted something to, uh, to, to, to really kind of stand out. And our martial arts academy is uh, Grogan's Academy of Martial Arts. And the Bullyproof brand, the reason I moved to Florida was uh, we got our academy still running in Edwardsville, Illinois. And we got uh, a guy that's been with me 16 years. He's managing the academy now, uh, blessed, and he does a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, I We wanted to move to Florida so I could expand. I've got a book coming out called uh, Becoming Bullyproof. It's me as a 12 year old meeting me as Master Grogan 40 years later. And we go on a journey together where the older me is teaching the younger me everything I wish I would have known, uh, pretty much everything we teach in the Martial Arts Academy. But uh, so that's kind of our, you see it on the wall there, our new brand. Uh, well, it's new, uh, I think it's seven years ago now, 2014, 15. So anyway, it's a uh, uh, bullyproof and kick and life and kick and life was actually the first one that was part of our Grogan's martial arts and kick and life is instead of life kicking your butt, you're kicking life's butt, man. <laughs> you're getting back up. So, but we, uh, um, I had a, uh, a guy I was working with a mentor said, yeah, they love the kick and life stuff, but nobody knows what it means. I'm like, man, it's obvious, isn't it? He said, no, he says, so I would put the bully proof what you're trying to do in front and say that, you know, you come bully proof in order to live your kick, best kick in life. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that's what we did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got, I got to start writing, writing me a book sooner or later. I mean, Make it, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt and tell you you need to okay and uh, uh, your story is is incredible and what you're doing is incredible but I am also gonna lie to you and say it's it's to me I barely graduated high school so writing a book has been a butt kicker it really has um, but I'm, if I can do it anybody can do it uh, and uh, I, I made uh, what it was you know, I made the top half of the graduating high school class possible because I wasn't in it. <laughs> Yeah. In the lower third, but uh, uh, that's something I'm proud of, just the reality of things. But, uh, but no, my gosh, uh, from what you know, in our brief connection here and what I've seen online and what you're doing, man, the world needs it. it it's it's tough writing a book, I'm not gonna lie, but man, they it, it's tough getting a fourth degree black belt too. So, writing a book's a heck of a lot easier than that, yeah. And speaking of writing books, I'm oh, I also talked to another um author who was also a martial artist, Tori Eldridge. I mean. Definitely, she wrote like three or three books. Well, three books are out now. It's like it's called the Ninja Daughter. Of course, I'm still reading the first one, and of course, she got these um, two other series, and of course, she got a new book coming out soon. So, I mean, I'm probably gonna go check that out. But I know I gotta get through the first book. I'm getting so interested in the first book. I mean, I wish I had more time to read it, but you know, it, it, everything I read so far, it's like, yeah, this should be a movie or a TV show. Yeah, awesome. so yeah. Well, and, and uh, obviously we talked earlier about the Bruce Lee philosophy and, uh, you know, Chuck Norris kind of with his organizations, the same thing. You bring it all in, you disregard what is it you and you add your special flavor uh, to make it your yours. And I, and I think that would be, you know, on a book, boy, oh boy. Uh, and I'm sure you do this already, but I'm just going to remind you. I got, I don't know how many of these little journals and big journals and always writing stuff in there. And uh, my bad thing is going back and actually looking at what I wrote down. But now that I wrote a book, <laughs> I've got to do it. But uh, it's it's powerful because you forget stuff. And uh, um, but yeah, your journey is unique in your own way. You've experienced things that nobody else has ever experienced. But at the same time, it's relatable where who has ever reading your books going to say, Oh man, yes, that happened to me too. Or I can connect to that or I can relate to that. And that's the greatest feeling in the world because oftentimes when we're experiencing troubles or hardships, we think it's the, we're the only ones. And you read a book and find out, Holy cow, this person's experienced it too. <laughs> All right. So before we kind of get to our um, hidden dojo segment of the um, interview, uh, is there any like ins inspirational quotes that um you can think of that describes your journey? Yeah, as there's uh, um, I self love them actually. The uh, 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 the only only way to avoid criticism is to say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. That's Aristotle. So just know you put yourself out there, you're going to take a beating whether you like it or not. Uh, but my favorite quote of all times is uh, by Zig Ziglar. And I'm blessed to be a Ziegler uh, speaker, trainer, and coach. And it, it's my favorite because it's had such a profound impact on me. Because uh, before I talked about it, the, the mind was never there. Barely graduated high school and everything else. Because I say up until 2012, I didn't know I could read because I chose not to read. Since 2012, I've been just taking in as much as I can. So the quote is, you are what you are and where you are by what's gone into your mind. 
you can change what you are and where you are by changing what goes into your mind. And so for me, that is the most powerful because um, I, 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 in the book, I talk about weeds in your mental garden. And just like weeds in any garden, if you don't dig up the weeds, you can't plant the seeds, right? Because you plant a seed, the weeds are going to suffocate it. So you got to dig those weeds out first and then plant the seeds. So I like to say 40 something years, I had a lot of weeds or a lot of garbage up there, limiting beliefs, self-doubt and uh, everything else. And I did a good job of camouflaging it, act like nothing's wrong, but it was, uh, it was, it was there. So my whole thing is trying to get it out. And some days I'm like, my gosh, do I got to keep digging that weed? Well, that weed after 40 plus years has really grown some roots. So you got to get that sucker out. So that's my favorite one is uh, the Zig Ziglar. And, uh, but my gosh, there's so many quotes. Uh, one of my quotes that I say to the kids all the time is uh, um, attitude and effort. You know, the attitude is the fuel to push that effort to be your very, very best. But if you don't have the right fuel, you're never going to have the effort that you need. So attitude and effort is where it's at. And that's the only two really qualities we evaluate our students on. Uh, athletic ability, some kids are gifted and some kids aren't, but everybody can have the right attitude to try their best and do their best. And everybody can have the right uh, amount of effort. And meaning even if they don't know how to throw a very good punch, it, it, this is a terrible attitude, right? But snapping that baby out there, that's the attitude. That's the effort we're looking for. And by applying that, you're going to get better. And uh, the follow-up quote to that, and the kids will finish it. I'll say, when you do your best, you become your, and the kids will say best. And I say, when you don't, you won't. And I say, either way, who's, who, who made the choice? You did. You made the choice to do your best, or you made your choice not to do your best. So when you become your best, pat yourself on the back because you earned it. When you don't, well, take the responsibility because you didn't put forth the best effort. <laughs> Yeah, I always say to the kids, um, it's better to humble yourself and be praised after than to praise yourself and be humbled after. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that goes right along with uh, um, <laughs> it, it, it's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. And the Spartans used to say, you know, sweat more in practice, bleed less in battle. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's all I say is you. The more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. Yeah. I think I seen that on a shirt. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, well, the shirt I got on today is uh, battle overcome succeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or I don't just say, I know also say, um, the, if you break a sweat, you become wet. If you don't try, you stay dry. Ooh, I like that. If you break a sweat. Uh, 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 say it again, please. Uh, if you break a sweat, you become wet. If you don't try, you stay dry. I love it. I'm going to have to <laughs> borrow that one. Thank you very much. Yeah. So definitely, if you're not breaking a sweat, then that, that means you're not putting effort. Yeah. And I mean, and really, I mean, how much uh, you, you put forth a little bit, you're going to start to sweat. That's that's all we ask, right? Because yeah. that little bit drives the, that's the fuel to drive that effort to do better. Good stuff. Yeah, I know when I'm sweating, I, I make a rain forecast. It's like a monsoon. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Getting those un, un, un toxins out of that body, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. All right, let's get to our Hidden Dojo um, um, segment. So, of course, this is going to be a ser series of questions. This is going to be a fun part. I love those Hidden Dojo. Uh, awesome. All right, so the first question is. This has been fun all along. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first uh, question would be um, the best advice you ever gotten and who said it? Oh, goodness. Well, um, there, there, there's been so many. I call them uh, my hashtags right hook of reality. <laughs> 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 Getting popped with a right hook of reality. Oh, my gosh. Um, there's just so many mentors. My, my, my dad was uh, uh, always good about uh, reminding me of hard work. He was a 101st Airborne Division, he's a Vietnam vet. So, and growing up on the farm was always tough with, with dad. It was never good enough. And, uh, but I know now he, he gave with his heart. It was always about work ethic, you know, and uh, pretty much he, he said it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how he said it, but pretty much <laughs> you're never going to be the biggest, you're never going to be the smartest, you're never going to be the strongest, but you can always make the decision and have the attitude to outwork everybody. That's something you can control. And uh, that was his, uh, and he, he didn't say it quite so eloquently as that. There were probably a few uh, uh, cuss words in there, but uh, that's just who he was. But it planted a seed early. And then uh, another mentor I worked with, he had said uh, good advice, your, your greatest strength, if not kept in check, can quickly become your greatest weakness. 
So having a desire to outwork everybody is great. And I, I kind of talk about this in a book and it's that uh, um, the being smaller and not, you know, smarter or whatever, I always wanted to prove everybody wrong. So to me for a lot of life, was a big F you to the world to anybody that told me I couldn't do something, which is good driving fuel. But if it gets to the point that all I want to do is prove everybody wrong, I've really lost my path of trying to help people. So it took another mentor to come along and remind me of, uh, of that is, yeah, that's good driving fuel. But if it's, if your whole intent is to prove people wrong, when is it over? If you got to fight every fight, when is it over? And what are you really wanting to do? Is that how you want to live your life or you don't want to live your life of actually helping people? So that was, uh, using that driving fuel, or I like to call it Bobby Boucher tackling fuel <laughs> <laughs> to get me through uh, was, was good, but it got to a point and I'm, I'm 51 now, I'll be 52 later this year. Uh, I need to, what, what, what do I want? Do I really want to fight every battle or I don't want to try and help people that want the help? So that was probably dad's advice about outworking everybody. But then, and this was only a couple of years ago, I had that mentor tell me, his name is Chris Widener. He had said, look, um, that, that's a great strength. But man, it's unchecked. It becomes a weakness because your whole life spent at, at, at what, what is your goal to prove everybody wrong? How is that really a life goal? And I'm like, wow, I never thought of it that way. So those two combined probably is the best advice. All right. So this next question, usually people don't get, usually can't find the answer for it, but here's, here we go. Uh, the worst advice you ever gotten. Ah, uh, well, it might, might be, uh, um, uh, <laughs> Worst advice is uh, 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 being told that uh, I, I, would, I would never amount to much and uh, being in, in, you know, dad with a push of you're never going to be smart enough. You're not going to be big enough. You're not going to be strong enough. Uh, it, it was good driving fuel advice. And I know why he did it because uh, he, he grew up dirt poor too and, you know, got severely wounded in Vietnam. He was kind of preparing me for the, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows and uh, another part of that advice was uh, that, 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 you know, you're, you're, why are you reading? Why are you trying? Why are you doing these extra things? And it, it was an advice that I took. Well, I, I guess I did when I was young, uh, younger. But uh, um, so that was, uh, I know now since 2012, since I learned I could read, that uh, um, I, I, I just uh, I try and absorb everything that I possibly can because I know how powerful it is, the power of knowledge. So the worst advice that I ever probably got was, why are you even trying? And, uh, and I've, of course, countered that with, why, why wouldn't I try? Well, why can't you just be like everybody else? And for a while there, I thought, maybe I should. So it was advice. Uh, I, I guess part of me wanted to take it, but the other part didn't. But now I've got it out of my garden there. So the, the, the advice I can give your listeners is, look, don't ever let anybody limit you. Your only limitation is yourself. Uh, people don't know you. You Only you know you. You know you better than anybody else knows you. But yet we take the advice and suggestions of others like, it, like, it's, like it's worldly knowledge. Well, I mean, yeah, take good advice from somebody you respect, but somebody you don't on social media that's ripping you apart, let them go. They're dealing with their own bullies. Don't let them bully you. Yep. All right. Number three, guilty pleasure. How do you reward yourself? Uh, well, I, I need to uh, reward myself more. And I actually, today was, uh, um, we moved to Florida for a reason. One, we love the beaches. <laughs> <laughs> and we wanted to go there to have the mental unwind is something about uh, we're on the uh, we're kind of southwest so we're on the uh, uh, golf side so we got the white beaches and uh, really crystal court white sands I mean my gosh it's almost like flower it's uh, it's fantastic and on the east coast side they got the uh, 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 like the sandy sand I don't know how you call it there but uh, this is uh, kind of the white court sand is on this this side and it's almost like flower uh, with all the shells and everything, but, uh, is, is to just to go on the beach and walk and unwind and meditate. Uh, and I haven't done that as much as I probably, uh, the whole reason we moved down here, I did the first month and then we kind of fell off it, but today we went back and, uh, and, and just spent a couple hours and it was fantastic. The other guilty pleasure is, um, uh, I, I, I um, I used to working out was, was, was everything to me. So I would go and just anytime do that. And I'd fall off that a little bit. I don't, I mean, I still do a workout, not as much as I probably should, but I don't know if that's really a guilty pleasure. Um, 
I, I guess, you know, I, I just, uh, I love seafood. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, steak and seafood. And then, you know, I enjoy dessert too. So uh, mm-hmm. chocolate cake or I, a Dairy Queen cake, maybe that's a better guilty pleasure for your <laughs> listeners. Uh, I, I do enjoy those. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so maybe, maybe that's more along the lines of a guilty pleasure. Going to the beach, I guess I shouldn't feel guilty. I should do that because it's the right thing to do to clear the mind. But maybe maybe your guest and what you're looking for is a guilty. I, I do enjoy chocolate cake and I do enjoy uh, um, um, ice cream cake. Oh, you know what? Now, now, you, now you got me thinking here. Uh, another <laughs> guilty pleasure that it probably isn't, isn't, I know it's not, it's definitely not a healthy one, but uh, in chance, hang out with the guys. I enjoy a cigar from time to time. So maybe I shouldn't say that that's bad, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, um, it, it, it's a way I'm a hyperactive guy. It helps me unwind. So there you go. I just felt my guts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're probably going to like this one question. What famous movie would you like want to be in? What famous movie? Well, um, I, I always want to be in a movie with Chuck Norris or uh, uh, I always liked uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, he was on the path and they kind of derailed a little bit, but to each their own. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to uh, um, pretty much any movie that uh, oh, oh, Carlos Norris, uh, Mr. Norris was in. I would love to, 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 to be in a movie with, uh, with him. I think that would be pretty doggone awesome. I always wanted to be on t- uh, Texas Walker or Walker, Texas Ranger when that series was out. I always wanted to star on that. Yeah. So uh, uh, that, would, uh, that, that, that would be it, uh, a, a movie like that. And maybe, maybe Chuck Norris is my dad and I'm his long lost son. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, call me crazy, but um, I like to be in a Disney movie. I mean, oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you now, which one? Do you, do you have a, a favorite one, or I, I'm I'm a sucker for the Lion King. Most. Oh my gosh, that is one of my absolute favorite. All right, so so you ready for this? Yep. <laughs> um, but Simba and uh, uh, the, the, the Mufasa. Yep. It's one of the things I would I would say when that movie first came out all the time. Uh, Mufasa, ooh, say it again. <laughs> yeah, and uh, no, I, that's one of my that, that, that uh, give me goosebumps here. That always touches my heart. The Lion King, I, that was absolutely one of my favorites. And well, now that we're talking about it, I always enjoyed Aladdin, and uh, we actually named one of our. Uh, uh, we had a dog named Princess Jasmine, and then we got a cat as for our kids, and we named the cat Raja. So my wife and I, when we were first married, we, we had our family photo with me and her and uh, 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 Jasmine and Raja. <laughs> that was our family photo. So how nutty is that? But no, I, we love Disney movies, and but Lion King is absolutely one of my absolute favorites. That's good. Yeah, I'm starting to develop that James Earl Jones voice. Yeah, yes, you are. And that, and that, I'm glad you said that because I was like, man, that sounds familiar. Yeah, James Earl. And the uh, the the Lion King cartoon one uh, came out, and that was it was it was good. But then uh, the uh, the the other Lion King, my gosh, yeah, goosebumps there, James Earl Jones. <laughs> yeah, a king's time as ruler rises and falls like the sun. <laughs> Send that in for Lion King too, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, of course, if James Earl Jones retires, then I can probably fill in for it. <laughs> Absolutely. And James Earl, you've done enough. Just go ahead and move aside. It's time for me to step up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Secret talent. Oh, secret talent. Um, uh, uh, I, I guess connecting with kids. Uh, Cause I'm nothing but a big kid at heart. And uh, I, I know that uh, what I didn't like as a kid, I try not to treat uh, my own kids or other kids that I interact with in that way. I, I, I try and be a big fun loving kid. I often say that I'm nothing but a, uh, a little kid trapped in this adult body and the little kid wants to get out. And probably the biggest disservice I've ever done to myself is think I had to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's, that's probably it. being able to connect with kids, just being, you know, kind of a, a, a fun loving kid myself. And when I forget that is when I'm, I'm, I'm the most unhappy. So uh, stay with my secret talents and uh, be a fun goofball and relate to kids and uh, just be a big kid. Yeah. Only time you had to be an adult is when you had to pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> that is the good part and, I, and that, that seems to come along too much i actually just had uh, my daughter uh she's 18 we went uh, her name's madeline 
And we bought her a, well, a newer car. It wasn't brand new. It was like a 2017. But I had her come with me uh, to the dealership and sit through the whole loan process. And she's like, dad, how long is this going to take? <laughs> so she sat through the whole process so she could learn how to do it. And then we just, this is just yesterday. We, uh, she sat through the auto, uh, setting up the automatic bill pay through her uh, checking account because she's going to pay her, her own car payment. So that was kind of her uh, version of, of, of learning how to pay bills and be an adult. Yep. And, uh, and she goes, I don't like this adult stuff. <laughs> I said, I don't either, sweetheart. <laughs> That's a good point. Let me tell you, got to be adults, pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dream celebrity encounter. Um, you, you, you know, uh, um, <laughs> we've been talking about him all night. I'm going to go back there. Uh, uh, is, is good old Carlos, Mr. Norris there, uh, encounter with him. And, and it was, like I said, Jean-Claude Van Damme. I always liked him because I, I, um, I, I knew his humble beginnings being from Brussels and uh, going up through. But I mean, if I met him, that would be cool nowadays, but uh, uh, oh, Chuck Norris, and I had a, uh, uh, an opportunity a few years ago when he was at the Martial Arts Super Show, and we just uh, weren't able to connect, uh, so I, I missed that, but uh, I would definitely love to connect with him, uh, so maybe we can make that happen. I could fly out to one of your tests and meet him or something. That would be unique and awesome. Yeah, you know, I know he's really approachable, but you know, you they want they kind of have him guarded pretty much. So I mean, you can't go up to ask for autographs. The only like the only time I can like get a picture with him is if I pay for the photo op. So that's oh. uh, yeah. So I pretty much been lucky for a couple years. I mean, I won a, a photo op in a raffle, so that's that's good. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, would, it would have to be uh, uh, in the. Carlos Norris, I, I, would, I would say. I've got, uh, um, I don't know, I, I, a lot of other folks have had the opportunity to meet through different encounters, which which is good. And I'm I'm not too starstruck by uh, uh, celebrities or, you know, uh, I've met my fair share, which I'm blessed to be able to say I have. And I think most of them, the celebrities, you just, uh, they just want to be treated like a, a, a normal human being. They don't like mm -hmm. all the star struck, not, you know, stuff. And um, I can't remember, I don't know that uh, when the person I asked for an autograph, I, I, I never been big, big on that either. It's, uh, it's more about uh, just happy to hang out with them or get a picture with them would be cool and, and go from there. Yeah, like I definitely go to Comic Cons a lot and I um, see these celebrities. And of course, um, I just talk to them like normal people. It's like I don't sound like I'm a, like a fanatic or pretty much, or I'm, I get nerve struck. But, you know, I just go up there and just say, hello, how you doing? So that's the. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think uh, um, the, the attitude that uh, they, they like it. I mean, you've got your own show now. You got your podcast and everything you're doing. You're a celebrity to to a lot of people. So if you carry yourself in that way, I know you humble enough. You probably don't want to hear it, but it's true. You're a celebrity in your own way. And you carry yourself with that and people can feel it, see it and want to be a part of it. And, and that's all that most quote, quote, celebrities want. I mean, of course, you've got uh, some out there, they're, they're, they're maybe not the best people. I don't know them personally, but uh, um, they teach their own. I don't know what battles they're fighting, but uh, um, yeah, you're definitely from what you're doing with your show here and uh, uh, your, your, your aerobic classes, your fitness classes, your martial arts classes, you're a celebrity to a lot of people. And uh, um, they're, they're probably afraid to approach you because of that same thing. And I know you're open and inviting. Hey, I'm a normal person, man. Come up and talk to me. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much this whole show pretty much got me out of my shell because, you know, I had to deal with that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you know, that kind of keeps you in the shell. But, you know, you want to get yourself out there. So kind of create something that's going to help you get you out of your shell. Yeah. yeah. And then it's helping thousands of people that uh, get to listen in, too. And, uh, and that's the thing we never really know, having shows and podcasts and stuff, how many people we actually connect with, you know, and it maybe it's only a handful. But uh, out of that, man, you're making an impact and changing lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. One last question before we cut out. Uh, 10 years from now. 10 years from now. We were actually just talking about this earlier today. Um, 10 years from now, uh, my kids will be uh, 31, 28, and 23. So uh, we'll, we'll probably downsize because right now we've got, uh, uh, we moved to Florida and uh, the whole tribe came with us. And uh, uh, so we'll probably downsize a little bit and would actually like to have a place on the beach uh, is what we'd like to do. I would, um, at that time, I would like to have, let's, let's say five, six books out 
and uh, and and uh, have given over a thousand speeches. I think that would be a good goal for me uh, to do that, and then also to uh, I enjoy talking, I enjoy being on stage, I enjoy power people. So just more or less focus on writing books and doing interviews on podcasts and uh, and giving speeches and presentations to empower others. That would be ideal to me. And then uh, 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 living on the beach where I could just walk out anytime and be right there on the beach. So that's kind of the ten year goal. Oh, yeah. Lovely. No, I'm look, probably looking forward to it. If I, if I get one of your books, definitely, I'll let you know. I mean, I'll see. We have to I'll, read it. I'll, I'll send you a, uh, just, you know, off offline here uh, in the Facebook message thing. Just uh, send me your address and I'll be glad to send you a copy. Um, it, April, uh, April 26th is when it's coming out. So that's okay. the book launch date is April 26th uh, for Becoming Bullyproof. We just actually finalized that date uh uh, what is today? Today's Tuesday on Thursday last week is we finally finalized the date that it's going to come out. So April 26th for uh, your listeners, if you're interested, it's called uh, Becoming Bullyproof and it'll be available everywhere. Um, and, you know, thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time. I know you wanted to hang out with your daughter right now, but uh, of course, I mean, I didn't want to take up too much time, but you know, you're here. We're having fun, but we are having fun and I appreciate it. I, I apologize. I got a bit of a talking problem and, uh, and I knew you and I would be right on sync from what I'd uh, kind of <laughs> learned about you there. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm trying to do and for your listeners here. Uh, 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 I'm trying to do a better job of, of, well, it sounds horrible, but I haven't always put my family first. I've always tried to grow in this and that and, uh, and do everything I can to seem like empower others. But sometimes my family gets put on the back burner. That's, I want you, you and your listeners to kind of learn from me and do a bit, little better job with that. And that's why I want to do both. I want to be on your show because I know how busy you are. I want to honor your time. But at the same time, I'd mentioned I want to do something with my daughter as well. So uh, I know we'd said uh, 45 minutes to an hour, but, you know, it, it, she poked her head in the door a little bit ago and gave me that thumbs up. So uh, that, that's why I feel pretty good about what we're talking about here. Cause I think she can hear what a good co uh, communication and conversation we're having here. And uh, uh, you know what you're doing, she respects, uh, she knows what I'm trying to do and it's right in line with what you're trying to do. And she respects that. Yeah. Of course I don't have daughters of my own, but I have two nieces. So that's okay. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I spent, how old are they? Oh, my oldest is, um, She's going to be 15 this year. Oh, and, my. And, of course, uh, my youngest is um, is going to be eight this year. So, yeah. Okay. Well, spend time with them because uh, uh, Madeline now, she is, she, she's a little older. Uh, Madeline's my 18-year-old. Austin's my 21-year-old. And Emmett is my 13-year-old. Uh, um, I'm, uh, this may this may end the podcast here, but I'm a huge Cowboys fan growing up on the farm. So that's Austin and Emmett. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough getting over the border of um, Canada. So um, no, that's where um, they live. My brother and my sister-in-law live in Canada with um, oh. my nieces. So I'm going to at least try to get over there and try to see them. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and cherish that time because they grow up so gosh darn fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's almost ready to drive. <laughs> uh, 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 so thank you very much for joining me, um, Rich Grogan. So hopefully... Your future, I hope you do well with everything you do. And of course, I'm going to bow everybody out in this podcast. Uh, so for those who are just tuning in this um, new podcast, make sure you tune into my previous episodes on the BICBPRadio.com, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And I'll see you next time for another episode here at the KickPod Podcast. This is your sensei, TJ Williams, bow you out.